Uh, in one case, you have someone who is known as a deceitful individual, uh, an individual who, at Benghazi, which I will never let go, quite frankly, because I think of those uh, two men who went up there on the top of that compound with machine guns, firing away, uh, allowing their colleagues to escape. And I'm sure in the back of their mind, they were just saying, if we can just hold on, help is on the way. But help was not on the way. When did we in the United States not send people to help our own people? You know, this is not who we are. And I would simply make it a referendum on honesty and integrity versus deceit and the Washington way. Martha. Thank you very much, Dr. Martha. Carson. I'm going to go back Martha. to David. Governor, we'll come to you in the next segment. When we come back, questions about race, about our veterans and social public and debate. And it's great to have you back at the podiums. And we want to turn to race in America and Mr. Trump. There are many who argue cell phones and smartphones are just now exposing uh, what's been happening in this country for years, cases of excessive force against minorities. As you know, Mr. Trump, on the other side, the FBI director recently said there's a chill wind blowing through law enforcement because of increased scrutiny. You have said police are the most mistreated people in America. As president, how do you bridge the divide? Well, there is a divide, but I have to say that the police are absolutely mistreated and misunderstood. And if there is an incident, whether it's a uh, incident done purposely, which is a horror and you should really take very strong action, or if it's a mistake, it's on your newscasts all night, all week, all month, and it never ends. The police in this country have done an unbelievable job of keeping law and order. And they're afraid for their jobs. They're afraid of the mistreatment they get. And I'm telling you that not only me speaking, minorities all over the country, they respect the police of this country, and we have to give them more respect. They can't act. They can't act. They're afraid for losing their pension, their job. They don't know what to do. And I deal with them all the time. We have to give great respect, far greater than we are right now, to our really fantastic police. Great. Mr. Trump. I did ask about bridging the divide, though, as president. So what would you say to the American families who say, we have lived through this, we have seen excessive force? What would you say to those? Well, families? they do. And, you know, they sue. Everybody sues, right? They see excessive, I mean, they go out, they sue. We have so much litigation. I see the courts. I see what they're doing. They sue. And you know what? We don't want excessive force. But at what point? You know, either you're going to have a police force that can do its job. I was just up in Manchester. I met with the police officers yesterday. Tremendous people. They love the area. They love the people. They love all the people. They want to do their job. And you're going to have abuse, and you're going to have problems, and you've got to solve the problems, and you have to weed out the problems. But the police in this country are absolutely amazing people. Mr. David, Trump, thank David, you. David, I do want to ask... Uh, I, I, want, I wanted to say, look, this, there can be a win-win here. Uh, I, I have formed a collaborative between police and community leaders because people have to respect law enforcement. A family doesn't want dad or mom going home in a box. And for our community leaders, many of them think the system not only works, uh, not, not only doesn't work for them, but it works against them. And I created a big collaborative in Ohio, made up of law enforcement, community leaders, the head of my public safety, and a former Democrat, liberal, State Senator Nina Turner run it. They got together, they made recommendations on recruiting, on hiring, on the use of deadly force, and what we're about to do is to bring community and police together so we can have a win-win. We need more win-wins in America, and we don't have to pick one over another or divide. We love the police, but we've got to be responsive to the people in the communities. Governor, we have to thank do you. all of it. Senator Rubio, I want to ask you next. <laughs> President Obama visited a mosque this week in America for the first time in his presidency. President George W. Bush visited a mosque after September 11th. You said of President Obama, quote, he's always pitting people against each other. So I'm curious, how are the two visits different, and would you visit a mosque as president? I would, but that's not the, the issue. My problem with what he did is he continues to put out this fiction that there's widespread, systematic discrimination against Muslim Americans. First of all, let's recognize this. If you go to a national cemetery in this country, you will see stars of David's and crosses, but you'll also see crescent moons. There are brave men and women who happen to be Muslim Americans who are serving this country in uniform and who have died in the service of this country. And we recognize that and we honor that. 
that. But by the same token, we face a very significant threat of homegrown violent extremism. We need to have strong, positive relationships in the Islamic communities in this country so they will identify and report this activity, especially mosques, for example, that are participating not just in hate speech, but in inciting violence and in taking acts against us. And I do believe it is important also to recognize, you want to talk about religious discrimination in America? Well, I don't think Barack Obama is being, so, is being sued by any Islamic groups, but he is being sued by the Little Sisters of the Poor. We are facing in this country Christian groups and tra groups that hold traditional values who feel and in fact are being discriminated against by the laws of this country that try to force them to violate their conscience. Senator Rubio, thank you. Martha. Governor Christie, earlier this week, the World Health Organization declared the Zika virus a global emergency. The same kind of mosquitoes that carry the Zika virus in Latin America are found here in the United States, and the virus has been linked to severe birth defects. Governor Christie, at the peak of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, you ordered an American nurse who landed at Newark Airport be detained and quarantined. As fear spread now of the Zika virus, and with the Rio Olympics just months away, is is there a scenario where you would quarantine people traveling back from Brazil to prevent the spread in the United States? You bet I would. And the fact is that because I took strong action to make sure that anyone who was showing symptoms, let me remember what happened with that nurse. She was showing symptoms and coming back from a place that had the Ebola virus active and she had been treating patients. This was not just some like we picked her up of just for the heck of it, right? We did it because she was showing symptoms. And the fact is, that's the way you should make these decisions. You make these decisions based upon the symptoms, the medicine, and the law. We quarantined her. She turned out to test negative, ultimately, after 48 hours, and we released her back to the state of Maine. But I want to add something on, on, on the issue of mosques. Now, I'm the only one up here who's got a law enforcement background and was the U.S. attorney after September 11th. I went to mosques throughout my state to build bridges, to build bridges between our community and law enforcement so we could get intelligence and information from these folks. I've had the experience of working with them as governor of New Jersey as well. We cannot mix the radical Islamic jihadists with everyday Muslim Americans. New Jersey has the second largest Muslim American population in America of any state. These are good, law-abiding, hard-working people. What they need is our cooperation and our understanding. They do not need just broadsides against them because of the religious faith they practice. Governor Christie, thank you. I'm going to move to Dr. Carson and go back to the Zika virus. Is that going too far, quarantining? You're a doctor. What would you do? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's not a simple issue. And now, you know, we've got evidence that there can be active viruses in other bodily fluids like saliva and urine. So this is going to be obviously a big deal. Uh, do we quarantine people if we have evidence that they are infected and that there is evidence that that infection can spread by something that they're doing? Yes. But, uh, you know, just willy-nilly going out and quarantining a bunch of people because they've been to Brazil, uh, I don't believe that that's going to work. What we really need to be thinking about is how do we get this disease under control? And this is, this is where we need rapid response. We need a rapid response for Ebola. We need rapid response for Zika. There will be other things that will come up. And uh, these are the kinds of things that the NIH, the CDC, can uh, be very effective in. We need to give them the appropriate support for those kinds of things. Thanks very much, Dr. Carson. I want to move on to the military. Senator Rubio, all restrictions on women in combat have been lifted as long as they qualify, positions including special operations forces like Navy SEALs. Just this week, the military leaders of the Army and Marine Corps said that they believe young women, just as young men are required to do, should sign up for selective service in case the draft is reinstated. Many of you have young daughters. Senator Rubio, should young women be required to sign up for selective service in case of a national emergency? Well, first let me say there are already women today serving in roles that are like combat, that in fact whose lives are in very serious danger. And so I'm, I have no problem whatsoever with people of either gender serving in combat, so long as the minimum requirements necessary to do the job are not compromised. But I support that. And obviously, if now, now that that is the case, I do believe that selective service should be opened up for both men and women in case a draft is ever instituted. I think the more fundamental challenge we're now facing is what's happening to the U.S. military. 
I've said this many times already, and I think it's important to start paying attention to this. Our Air Force is about to be the smallest it's been in 100 years. I'm sorry, in our history. Our Army is set to be smaller than it's been since the Second World War. And our Navy is about to be the smallest than it's been in 100 years. I think we need to begin to refocus on rebuilding our military, because every time we have cut our military in the history of this country, we have had to come back later and rebuild it, and it costs more, and it's a lot more chaotic and dangerous. When I'm President, we are rebuilding the U.S. military. Thank you, Senator Rubio. Governor Bush, do you believe that young women... Say it again. Do you believe young women should sign up for selective service, be required I, I to do, do so? I do, I do. And I think that we should not impose any kind of uh, political agenda on the military. There should be, if women can, can um, re-meet the requirements, the minimum requirements for combat service, they ought to have the right to do it, for sure. Uh, it ought to be focused on the morale as well. We ought to make sure that we have readiness uh, much higher than we do today. We need to eliminate the sequester, which is devastating our military. We can't be focusing on the political side of this, we need to realize that our military force is how we project our word in the world. When we are weak militarily, it doesn't matter what we say. We can talk about red lines and ISIS being the JV team and reset buttons and all this. If we don't have a strong military, then no one fears us and they take actions that are against our national interests. Tell me what you'd say to American people out there who are sitting at home, who have daughters, yeah. who might worry about those answers and might why, worry why, why that the worry draft is reinstituted. Well, the draft's not going to be reinstituted, but why if, if, if women are, are should accessing... should you just do away with it? No, I didn't say that. You, you, you asked the question not about the draft, you asked about registering. And if women are going to be supporting... the draft. If, but if we don't have a draft. I'm not suggesting we have a draft. What I'm suggesting is that we ought to have readiness being the first priority of our military, and secondly, that we make sure that the morale is high. And right now, neither one of those are acceptable because we've been gutting the military budget. We also need to reform our procurement process. We need to make sure that there are more men and women in uniform than people, than civilians in our defense department. There's a lot of things that we need to do to reform to bring our defense uh, capabilities into the 21st century, and I'm the guy that could do that. That's why I have the support of generals, of admirals, of 12 uh, Medal of Honor recipients, and many other people that know that I would be a steady commander-in-chief and rebuild our military. Martha. Thank you very much. Can I, can I, be, really, can I be really clear on this? Because I am the father of two daughters. Uh, one of them's here tonight. Um, what my wife and I have taught our daughters right from the beginning, that their sense of self-worth, their sense of value, their sense of what they want to do with their life comes not from the outside, but comes from within. And if a young woman in this country wants to go and fight to defend her country, she'd be permitted to do so. And part of that also needs to be a part of a greater effort in this country. And so there's no reason why one young woman should be discriminated against from registering for the Selective Service. The fact is, we need to be a party and a people that makes sure that our women in this country understand anything they can dream, anything that they want to aspire to, they can do. That's the way we raise our daughters, and that's what we should aspire to as president for all the women in our country. Thank you very much, Governor Christie. Can I say We've something? We've just about, covered, uh, wait one second, Dr. Something Carson. Something about the draft, just very quickly. Very quickly. Um, you know, 14% decrease in the number of people applying for voluntary military service, and I think part of it is because of the way that we treat our veterans. You know, we wouldn't be a free country if it wasn't for them. And we have 22 veterans per day committing suicide. So I think what we should do is have an external support system for people once they volunteer, and it should follow them throughout their career. Uh, they should follow them for three years or five years afterwards. A year before they get out, it should be working on integrating them back into society so that uh, they quit on Friday and they start their new job. They should have health empowerment accounts that are subsidized so they can go to any medical facility and be taken care of. They can go to a VA if they want to. But if we start taking care of our veterans the right way, we won't have to ever worry about a draft again. Thank you very much for bringing up that subject, Dr. Carson, of our veterans. And for another question about our veterans, we go back to Josh McKelvin from WMUR. Josh. Thank you, Martha. None of you on stage tonight have ever worn a uniform as a member of the armed service. That's the reality of it, but uh, as a commander in chief, you'll also be charged with the care of 23 million active duty service <coughs> members and veterans in this country. Some have suggested privatizing the VA as a way to enhance care and increase the quality of the care uh, and access. Others say that uh, veterans should carry 
ID cards that would allow them access to any hospital or healthcare provider. Governor Bush, what specifically would you do to ensure